All right, so let's go ahead and get started. It's 3.03. My name is Leti Terrones. I am one of the librarians that will be presenting today's session. Um, our session is called ChatGPT, Friend or Foe. And we will be providing the same exact session again this week on Thursday, April 11th at 3 p.m. via Zoom using the same uh, Zoom link that you use for today. So in case you miss it or you want to pass the info on to your friend, um, please feel free. So um, before we get started, I just want to drop into the chat some links that you might need for today. The first link is the link to the um, attendance form. And um, the attendance form really is just a, an email um, a, a Google form that when you fill it out, you will receive an email confirmation with your answers to that form. And you can present that if you need to present it to anyone to, for instance, if your professor has asked you to attend today's session, or if you're attending for EOP or something like that, this can serve as your confirmation um, that you were here at the session. We are also recording the session and Kelsey has added um, the link to our Cal State LA YouTube channel where we will upload today's recording. Please subscribe to that YouTube channel to catch not only this recording, but tons of other uh, tutorials that we have um, made for you. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I'm Leti Terrones. I'm the Ethnic Studies Librarian at Cal State LA, and I'm so happy to have my wonderful colleague with me uh, to present the workshop. Jayati. Hello, everyone. My name is Jayati Chaudhuri. I'm the Health and Human Services Librarian, and I'm so happy to be here today with you all. Okay, so we have um, some goals for today's session. Uh, please also just keep in mind that uh, chat GPT, whoops, let me go back really quickly. Um, there's a lot of information and a lot of ways to talk about chat GPT and generative AI, but we're really wanting to focus on uh, providing an understanding of the way that these AI technologies are really part of our everyday lives and are often used in platforms um, at college. Uh, so in higher education platforms, we're often um, dealing with these AI technologies and we're gonna talk about what those are, but we really are gonna focus on the way to use chat GPT as, a, as a, a springboard or as a starting point from which to create your own work for college. We wanna emphasize the importance of creating your own work. We're not wanting to be punitive about the way um, chat GPT works or we don't want to um, like, punish students, you know, um, for even thinking about ChatGPT. But what we want to really emphasize instead is that ChatGPT is yet another tool that is available. And we want to also um, encourage you to use it and understand it, but use it as a springboard for making your own work and submitting your own work um, for college. We're also going to discuss the limitations of ChatGPT, and then we're going to close off with a discussion considering the ethical implications of ChatGPT. So we have our presentation divided into four parts. We're gonna first talk about what is AI and how does ChatGPT fit within that. We're gonna talk about how to use ChatGPT specifically for library research. And we're also going to talk about the limitations of ChatGPT and ethical questions. And I'll send it now to Jayati. So first we are going to talk about what is an AI or artificial intelligence. And we are going to give you some examples of AI. And then we are going to start talking about ChatGPT, our main focus for today's presentation. 
So what is an artificial intelligence? Artificial intelligence is the science of making machines that can think like humans. It can do things that are considered smart. So the capacity of machines to mimic human cognitive functions such as learning, problem solving, and pattern recognition, enabling them to perform tasks that normally require human intelligence. That is what is artificial intelligence is. So it, AI technology can process large amounts of data and the goal of AI is to be able to do things such as recognize for a pattern, converse in a written ways, make decision and judge like humans. So here are some examples of AI technologies. Those are deeply embedded in our day-to-day -day lives already. For example, virtual assistants like Siri, Google, Alexa. I'm sure some of you or all of you have probably used one of them. Hi Siri, hi Google, hi yes, Alexa. Yes. What is the weather today? Mm -hmm. So that's AI talking to us. Then, then the recommendation system used in e-commerce platforms or in viewing platforms, like or in social media platforms. So when you are watching something in YouTube or Netflix, or if you are interacting in different social media platforms, or you are purchasing in Amazon Prime, Based on our viewing habits, we get recommendation. That's AI-generated recommendation we are getting. Then there are already autonomous vehicles like Tesla. Without any human touch, it can drive the vehicle. There are facial and image recognition in security systems. So you can see that AI is deeply embedded in our day-to-day -day life today. Now let's talk about different types of AI generators. So there are several different types of age AI generators. This include uh, text generators, music generators, art and image generators. So AI can generate the following new content. It can generate text, which is chat GPT. We are going to talk about uh, text generated AI today. It can also generate images. For example, Canva, Meta Eye, Deep Brain. They are the, these are the three names of the image generator AI. For example, today, just before our presentation, I actually wrote a prompt to Meta AI, which is a generator for WhatsApp, Text generator, text chat service. I wrote a prompt like generate an image of two librarians teaching a chat GPT session. And it generate, it did generate that image for me. So there is text generator, email, image generator AI. There is also music generator AI. For example, Suno AI or Sound Draw. Those are two names of the music generator AI where you can write a prompt like make a song for my Valentine and it will generate a song for you. Then there is video generator AI like Deep Brain AI where it can actually generate an entire video for you uh, through this AI system. So it's pretty fascinating. And today we are mostly going to focus on the text generative AI part. So here are some examples of text generative AI. Text generative AI is a process where an AI system produces written content imitating human language patterns and styles. Uh, Chat GPT and Chat GPT Plus, those are two most popular text generative AI platforms, but there are others too, like Copilot or Bing Chat. Uh, Copilot is a chatbot developed by Microsoft and it was launched just last year in 2023. Based on a large language model, it is able to cite sources, generate text, create poems, write songs. So this service was introduced under the name of Bing Chat, but now it is called Copilot. 
Google Bard is after Chat GPT was introduced in November 2022. It has become so popular around the world. Google obviously developed their own AI chat platform as the name of Google Bard. So if you there are this good, there is this Google Bard chat AI system that you can use to generate text. Now it is called Gemini and it was launched just last year 20 in 2023. So as you can see, text generative AI is everywhere and all of us probably knowingly or unknowingly use it somewhere <laughs> in different chat platforms. So next move on to the next slide. As you all probably already know that we do offer chat reference services, reference service via chat from the university library. And this chat service is covered by Cal State LA librarians. However, AI powered chat services have indeed become so common that while covering our chat service, recently I received this question, are you a real person or AI? <laughs> so maybe in near future, we are going to offer the chat service through an AI with the help of an AI. Since it is so common nowadays, before I begin, I want to ask you this question in our next slide. Have any of you use chat GPT so far? So to answer this question, you can either take a picture of this QR code or you can go to menti.com and then write the code 97763325. So you can do it in both ways. Thank you, Kelsey. Okay, so I think the QR code is working. Um, oh, let's see, it should be active now. Um, let me try the QR code. Uh, if you click on the QR code, it should say, uh, it should take you right to, to the survey. Okay, let's just give it a minute or so. Um, we can keep a, an eye on the clock. I'll keep an eye on the clock, Jayati. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we'll give it to about um, 317. So feel free to add your vote in here. Um, I just wanted to say that the survey, the questions are anonymous. So the survey tool that we're using, which is called Mentimeter, it doesn't record your name or your location or anything like that. Um, and uh, it's really just to interact with you and also to kind of figure out like, you know, uh, are you, have you used ChatGPT? Are you familiar with this technology? So there's no right or wrong answer. Thank you for that explanation. Important explanation, lady. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I agree. Alejandro, it looks like um, the majority of our attendees are voting yes on the yes side. And I think ChatGPT, if I'm not mistaken, Giadi, was launched in November 2022. Is that yes. right? Yes. So it's a super new technology. And we're all, all also trying to figure out, you know, um, how to respond to it. And we're going to get into a little bit more of the weeds of that, of how to respond to it um, as we do the presentation. We had another question. Is that right, Jayati? Yes. So that would be the expansion of this question. If you have used chat GPT, you can write to us how you have used chat GPT. And it can be just one sentence or it can or be brief. Word. Yeah, or even a word. I know I've used Chat GPT to um to write an email that was a little bit complicated for me. Um, I ended up working like 
typing in chat GPT, I need to write this email about this, this, this. Um, but then I kind of just got some language from it and I ended up writing my own email, but it was, it gave me some like good ways of starting it. Yeah. And I, I also used it to um, write a letter of support for, for some colleagues. Um, but again, it, I just used it to kind of get like my writing inspiration going. All right. So let's see. So we yeah. are getting some answers here, Jayani. We are getting very interesting answers. Like rewrite lyrics to songs, which included puns, only the theme language. Yeah, right. I agree with whoever wrote it's beneficial because it allows me to restructure my writing a lot. I totally agree with that. And then Kelsey also added into the chat um, to write a, a poem for uh, their friend uh, using chat GPT that includes all of these different elements that seem seemingly disparate, but sort of, um, okay, and it kind of like in the style of Shakespeare. <laughs> Yeah, um, I really like um, the other person who put, um, oops, the other person who put give an idea of how to structure um, a CV, yes. lesson plans. Yeah, so there are a lot dances. of, there's a lot of different ways that we are using ChatGPT. Again, really this um, survey is just to kind of give us an idea of how you've been using it and playing around with ChatGPT. I know some professors are also, creating lessons um, for their students that use ChatGPT in order to interrogate some of the some of the questions around, you know, the uses of ChatGPT and especially the ethical questions around it. So um, what do you think, Jadi? Are we ready to move on to the next? Yeah, sure. Okay. I'm glad that we got like mixed answers. Like some of you have not used ChatGPT, some of you uh, have already used chat GPT. So for those of you who have not used chat GPT, just to explain to you all the word chat GPT stands for chat generative pre-trained transformer. Okay, it's a chatbot developed by OpenAI and launched on November 30th, 2022. So it's, a, as Leti mentioned, it's a pretty new technology based on a large language model. It enables user to refine and steer a conversation towards a desired length, format, style, level of detail and language. So to create, for those of you who have not used ChatGPT, to create uh, or use ChatGPT, anyone can go to chat.com openai.com this url again is chat.openai.com url and start using chat gpt chat gpt is available uh, uh, as free but there is also another version available which is a paid version which is chat gpt 4 so the free version is chat gpt 3.5 which is free Now, we also, because ChatGPT can talk with us or converse with us, we asked ChatGPT to, to explain itself in 50 words. And here is, here is its answer. ChatGPT is a large language model developed by OpenAI. So that part is right based on the GPT's 3.5 architecture. It can generate human-like text based on input prompts, answer questions, perform a variety of natural language processing tasks. It was trained on a massive data sets of internet text to learn patterns and relationship in language. So your so this is how ChatGPT defines itself. Let's move on to the next slide. When it is safe to use ChatGPT, the most important question, right? <laughs> so if you are planning to use ChatGPT, if you look at the diagram on the left, you can ask yourself, like, does it matter if the output is true? If it doesn't matter, then you are 100% free to use ChatGPT. It is 100% safe to use ChatGPT. But just to be realistic, we all want our 
output to be correct, right? So if you want your output to be correct, then ask yourself the next question. Do you have the expertise to verify that all output is accurate? Are you willing to take full responsibility for missed inaccuracies? So if the answer is yes, then you can use chat GPT, but make sure to verify each output word and sentence for accuracy and common sense. Please understand that your job as a student and critical thinker is to verify the accuracy of the content generated by ChatGPT. Do not simply take ChatGPT content as true at face value. Make sure to fact check ChatGPT's content if you are using it to communicate something factual and credible. That's extremely important. <laughs> Next slide, please. Okay, so next, now that you we have given you an introduction to ChatGPT and when it is safe to use ChatGPT, Leti is going to talk about using ChatGPT for library research. Okay, thank you. Um, I just, you know, was thinking about what you were saying, uh, Jayati, about, um, you know, that diagram about when it's safe to use it and thinking about the chat um, that um, Kelsey dropped into the into our Zoom chat about the poem. So like if you're wanting to write a creative poem um, in the language of Shakespeare that involves all of these different things, um, I think that, and it doesn't have to be, you know, accurate. I think that's a really good example of just go for it and use it and play out, play around with it. But if you're doing library research, or writing an assignment, uh, researching and writing an assignment for college, you definitely need it to be accurate and you will definitely need to see if the information ChatGPT generates for you is accurate. So um, kind of to get us started with, um, to kind of get us started with um, our, um, with that part, let me go ahead and ask the next question that we have. So um, go ahead and click on the uh, link up to the QR code that's showing up and let us know if you have in fact used ChatGPT regarding any kind of academic research, what have you used it for? Have you used it for um, getting background information on a topic, getting a citation for a paper, paraphrasing or writing paragraphs, getting words to research, um, getting keywords to research uh, a topic in a database. Um, what kinds of ways have you used this technology for? Okay, so we're starting to get some idea here. And um, a lot of people are use, are saying that they're using it to get background information, um, to write investigative questions, to paraphrase or rewrite paragraphs, or to make outlines. So all of these are different examples that we're going to kind of point out to you um, in the presentation, we um, for those of you who are doing or ha who have used um, ChatGPT for uh, in an academic or research context, as as we're showing here, um, we're going to get into the next slide in just a second. Um, let us know which um, subject areas perhaps you have used it in, but let's give it maybe um, thirty more seconds or so. If anybody else wants to um, add how, you know, in which context they've been using ChatGPT. And again, you can take a picture of the QR code or you can go to the menti.com and use the code to answer question. Um, and again, this is a totally anonymous survey um, and you don't have to do it either. Uh, it's totally, you know, um, open to, to you to, to participate or not. Um, someone has put um, not applicable. Very good. So um, what are some of the subject areas or majors? Um, okay, so we see ethnic studies, um, English, psychology, healthcare laws. You know, I've listened to so many different podcasts about chat GPT and generative AI. Jayati and myself have like been immersed in like learning more about chat GPT. And uh, one of the podcasts I listened to was talking about how in the healthcare sector, um, 
the the chat GPT and generative AI technology is used quite frequently because um, a lot of people who work in that sector use it um, to kind of generate emails or or um, writing that has kind of like a similar um, tone to it or a similar kind of content content to it. So, okay, so yeah, I'm seeing um, TESOL, very good. Yeah, I'm, um, English is my second language, so I can definitely see, um, you know, how um, ChatGPT can be helpful with that. Um, but also, you know, um, things like, you know, in an English class as well, family law coding. All right, wonderful. So it's really good to see all of these different um, ways um, ChatGPT is being put to use. I like whoever put critical thinking, that's right. Yeah. We will also wanna to emphasize to you throughout the session that ChatGPT is not as smart as a human being. We're way more smarter, we're more complex. Um, and uh, we, want, we wanna make sure you know that. Okay. So let's go to um, let's go to some examples of how we can use ChatGPT um, in the context of library research. And we're going to demo four different ways. The first one we want to show is how to apply keywords or how to kind of generate keywords if you're searching in a database for um, a topic. We also want to talk about developing questions and things to remember, keep in mind if you're using ChatGPT to get summaries and key readings. And then we'll demo also how ChatGPT can provide very helpful outlines for your research. So here is a canned example. You have the link to the slides, so you can bookmark them. But these are just examples that we have taken directly from ChatGPT. So the LT right there, that's me asking ChatGPT, um, you know, to generate a list of questions if I want to research gentrification. And then on the other side, um, I have um, kind of like a longer question, but I, but what I'm asking for is how to generate keywords to study family relationships and dynamics. So, okay, let's take a look at how this actually works um, live. So. Here is my question. What are some of the keywords um, keywords to use to research about gentrification? And here I've, it's generated for me some words like urban development, neighborhood change. And then the ones I'm kind of interested in kind of deal right here, like um, housing affordability, social inequalities. But I'm not 100% satisfied with the results that ChatGPT is giving me. So I can click this regenerate and it's gonna do more. It's gonna try to give me um, some more. Um, but what I can also do is I can also create a new chat and um, ask it to kind of focus on, um, uh, give me keywords to research uh, gentrification and class, right? Because a lot of times, um, what's happening with gentrification is that there's this inequality of um, like a class inequality. And so here it might give me a few more. I can also regenerate that a bit more and it'll start kind of adding more to that. And so what you would do as a student is you would um, use one of these uh, terms and drop it into one search using like a combo, for instance, gentrification and social stratification. I hope that makes sense. Throw me a thumbs up if that all kind of sounded like that makes sense. You can throw me a thumbs up. And it's hard for me to see a little bit of the all of the participants, but okay. Kirill, thank you. Wonder, thank you. Okay, so let's move on to our next example. Um, and here, um, some of the things that you might be asked to do in class, and one of the ways that we also teach how to get started with research at Cal State LA Library, we often um, have this idea of developing a starting question, a question of investigation. And sometimes these are known as research questions, but research questions also can get very um, refined and very sophisticated. So kind of thinking about like starting a general question of investigation, um, like for instance, what's the relationship between climate change and indigenous people, let's say, 
um, we can ask that to chat GPT and then chat GPT can then provide us with some, some questions that we can again use as a springboard to develop our own specific question that we wanna get the answer to via our research. Again, we wanna really just emphasize that ChatGPT is not a shortcut. Instead, it can be used and leveraged as a springboard for you to kind of get your, your ideas going and then to generate your own work. Here is an, a, a very important one that we like to emphasize, especially at the library, because uh, so many of our databases um, and a lot of our resources provide this kind of thing where we uh, can use um, our databases to give us some summaries of important concepts. But, you know, um, chat GPT, you, we can also leverage it for that. Um, in this example, we're asking it, what is community cultural wealth? This is an important concept uh, in across many, many disciplines. I think it, it emerges in education, but it's also used throughout many different disciplines to think about the ways that um, people and their cultures um, really infuse um, us people with different types of assets. So um, it was coined by Tara Yoso, I think in 2005. And so when I asked ChatGPT to provide me a summary of what this concept is and the scholarly reference to it, it does it, it does its job. It gives me really like a really quick brief summary of what the concept means. It tells me, you know, um, the the essay that kind of establishes this concept and then the six frameworks that form community cultural wealth as a concept and framework. One of the things that I want to emphasize to you though is that ChatGPT is known to make up stuff. It is known to just sort of say, oh, this is the answer, presto, but then it, you know, it's actually not accurate. So what you need to do as a student is you need to make sure, again, like Jayadi was saying in the very beginning, you got to cross check this reference and see in fact, if this is an accurate uh, citation, if this essay was actually written. And I can tell you that it is and the citation is, is accurate here. Um, I also want to just say though, that this is a really short, like teeny tiny bit of what cultural community, community cultural wealth is, and it doesn't really get into how um, scholars and thinkers have developed this concept and have expanded it across disciplinary areas. So that is another thing to keep in mind. All right, one of the things that all, always challenges us is sort of like, how do I get started? And sometimes getting an outline of what your paper can look like can be very helpful. So here is an outline, but I'm gonna demo it for you live. Um, and I have it, kind of set up here already. Um, so can you provide an outline for a research paper? So let's just, I'm gonna re-ask that question on a new chat so we can get a fresh generated chat. Can you provide an outline for a research paper that deals with global and local air pollution? And also I'm thinking about like how um, global and local air pollution has um, or affects uh, people's health. So if I do that, what it will do is it'll provide me kind of again with like just a starting point that has, as you can see from here, when it finishes, it has a beginning, a middle, and then a, con and a conclusion and end. So even if you have something like this, an introduction, and then it says, okay, first thing to do in the introduction is provide information on air pollution. Oftentimes that can really help you as a student to just kind of, you know, get your bearings and have like, um, like belief in yourself, like, you know what, I got this, here's my outline. And um, I can also change it up. I might not, you know, um, put all of these different factors in here. I might, in terms of the health risk, I might look into one or two of these that it's pointing out um, and so far and, and so on. So again, the point that we're really wanting to emphasize here is that ChatGPT can provide a starting um, outline for you, a starting jump off point for you to then do your do your work. We also have um, in the slides, which we're happy for you to keep and, you know, bookmark examples of having, um, of citing ChatGPT. So you might have an assignment where your professor is asking you to, 
to play around with ChatGPT and then cite it or quote it. So we're not going to get into the weeds of how to cite uh, ChatGPT in APA style, but we are providing you with the examples in the links here. Okay, so this is taken from the APA style manual of how to cite um, ChatGPT in APA style. Same thing, how to cite ChatGPT in MLA style. Again, we're taking this directly from the MLA manual. And then how to cite um, ChatGPT in Chicago style, again, from the manual. Um, okay, so let's go on to our next question. So let me bring up our um, our next question here. Um, what do you think our students and our, uh, our guests who are attending Chat GPT helps me to do better in my assignments. Feel free to um, click on the QR code, snap a picture of it with your QR code reader on your phone or your device, and um, give us your opinion. And there's lots of, you know, it's lots of uh, a range of opinions. So let us know what you think here. And then we can also invite um, any comments at this point, too, if anyone would like to raise their Zoom hand to make a comment about this question. Um, I want to also just kind of say that, you know, this is a it's a very dynamic and still emerging technology. And so, um, you know, the, the cards are, are still kind of out on how ChatGPT and other sorts of text, um, a generative text, text AI will be changing our world, the way we work. All right, so. Um, Again, you can go to the menti.com and use the same code to answer to this question, or you can take a picture of our QR code. And the question will stay on. We're gonna move on to our next slide, but um, the question will stay on. So if you're kind of thinking about it or thinking about whether you wanna participate in the survey that's totally anonymous, um, please feel free to do so. <laughs> Again, if also if there's a question at any point, um, please feel free to um, add your question in the chat, or also you can um, use your reaction button to raise your Zoom hand. Okay, Jaddy. Yes. So now that we have gotten your received your answer about how you are, we have explained how you can use ChatGPT in library research. And we have seen that some of you agree that ChatGPT can help us with our homework. Let's talk about the limitations of ChatGPT that we all need to be aware of, okay? So next slide, please. The first limitation is lack of contextual awareness. ChatGPT is unable to comprehend, comprehend context and background information. So a solution could be offering more context to the AI model. ChatGPT is trained on a large set of text data and the data may contain bias or prejudices. This means that ChatGPT may sometimes generate responses that are unintentionally biased or discriminatory. A solution could be to detect and eliminate bias information from ChatGPT's text. Also, ChatGPT has been shown to produce some terrible answers that discriminate against gender, race, and minority groups, which is the company is trying to mitigate. So this is these are the limitations you need to be aware of. Then lack of empathy and limitations in complex reasoning. Uh, it struggles with complicated reasoning and problem-solving activities. The, the chat GPT model may also produce responses that are technically correct, but may not be entirely accurate in terms of context or relevance. Uh, 
This limitation can be particularly challenging when processing complex or specialized information where accuracy and precision are crucial. You should always take steps to verify the information ChatGPT generates. Also, you can find some grammatical errors while using ChatGPT. Next slide, please. Lack of emotional intelligence, not understanding sarcasm or irony or lack of common sense. We can put all these three within that lack of common sense or human intelligence uh, part that chat GPT is not able to understand emotions and true meaning behind the sentence. It cannot detect subtle emotional cues or respond appropriately to complex emotional situation. While chat GPT can generate human-like responses or has access to a large amount of information, it does not possess human-level common sense. And chat GPT may sometimes provide inaccurate responses to certain questions or situations that we are mentioning to you uh, several times already. <laughs> While chat GPT is excellent at generating la natural language responses, its mathematical capabilities are limited. And I have seen from our quiz responses that we have some students from math probably according to a study conducted by an associate professor at Arizona State University, chat GPT's accuracy on mathematical problems was below 60% accuracy. So if you use this chat GPT to try and balance an equation or solve a mathematical problem, there is a chance that it will be a mistake. As a result, if you are using chat GPT to solve math problems, you should always double check your input. Then the hallucinating facts and figures. The most significant limitation of chat GPT is that it can hallucinate information. In practice, this means it can make up false information or facts and present them to users with confidence. Also then there are different versions of chat GPT available and the paid version is gives you more options to hold longer conversation, reason better and write code, which are not available in the free version. Next slide, please. Okay, so to be better use chat GPT, quality answers depends on quality of direction. So creating, creating perfect prompts is crucial to harness the full potential of chat GPT. For example, if you just write, tell me about AI history, it won't be that effective than if you write, summarize the history of AI in three key milestones. So if, you, if we can write a better prompt or give better direction to chat GPT, it will give us better answer. Uh, another example would be what are the health benefits of exercise? It's very broad, right? Very open-ended. But if we can write a prompt like how does regular exercise improve our cardiovascular health, then you will get a better answer. So again, creating perfect prompts is crucial to get full potential from uh, chat GPT, the relevance of its response will depend on the quality of your prompts. If your prompts are vague or incomplete, the AI might generate confusing or unrelated answers. Conversely, well-crafted prompts can ensure high quality results. So that's another thing to be mindful about. Next slide, please. So here, uh, here are some examples of how to write chat GPT prompt. So you can assign a role to chat GPT, include everything in your prompt that you think will help chat GPT to do a better job. Give more context, Give get creative with the backstory and you never know what the extra material might mean for what is produced. 
Also, you can give different examples, be specific in your rules, and you can tell like ask for input, output in a two column table, give a paragraph of answer, be more definite about your rules. And to be, and you put the more chat GPT then can be creative within those rules. And last but not least, always evaluate your answer that you are getting from chat GPT. So those are some of the limitations of chat GPT. Next slide, please. Here is, uh, here is, those are some limitations that I explained to you all uh, about chat GPT, but we always want to ask also chat GPT about what are the common mistakes chat GPT makes. And you can see the responses That's I have given from the chat GPT. And you can see it is taking, talking about generating incorrect information, lack of context, Overuse of certain phrases, ambiguity, biased information, uh, inappropriate responses, repetition, and incomplete answers. So ChatGPT itself told us about its limitation, but now we can see it on live, uh, if that is possible, Leti, about some of the common mistakes ChatGPT makes. Okay, so Leti already asked the question, what are the common mistakes chat GPT makes? So you can see the answer in chat GPT platform. Factual errors, incomplete responses, lack of emotional intelligence, lack of context awareness, reputation. So again, uh, we all need to evaluate answer we are getting from chat GPT before using it for any hour academic purposes. Let's move Hi. on to that. You can also click on the regenerate button. I was just gonna say that um, the other example that we had, had like a long list, the one that we have in the slides, a long list. So um, in here, uh, when we asked it to regenerate, um, it gives um, a bit like a shorter uh, response Fonts. So remember, if you interact um, with ChatGPT and kind of keep pressing it for, come on, ChatGPT, be real with me. Give me all the mistakes that you commit. <laughs> it'll it'll respond to that. It'll respond to that sort of prompt. And then it'll probably start to give you um, the long list that we've included here um, in the in the slides. Okay. Yeah, and one of the mistakes that ChatGPT didn't include that I wanted to include on this slide that ChatGPT can also fabricate references and content. So this is actually, I've gotten this screenshot from a peer reviewed article published recently in 2023 actually. So uh, the title of the article is Shortcomings of Chat GPT and where the author asked Chat GPT the question that write a hundred word report on arsenic in rice based on one publication in the recent peer reviewed uh, literature. And you can see that Chat GPT did generate the report on arsenic in rice, but then the reference it generated which is not right, which is not correct. So uh, the author actually double checked the references and the DOI number is re real. The number you see at the very end of the uh, reference screen. And then if, but it goes to a different, totally different article. So you can see the, the article publication here is the same, but the page number is different and it goes to a totally different article. So the references that reference that chat GPT pro provided, it's not correct. So that is another limitations of chat GPT that it can fabricate references. Also, I also want to mention that 
not only that there are several many limitations of using chat gpt here at cal state la faculty are discussing about adding use of chat gpt in the academic dishonesty policy and also we use turnitin which can which is now claiming that it can detect uh, chat gpt uses or uses of ai from the writing so just be mindful that uh, when if you are planning to use it for your academic research purpose that you really need to you can get chat gpt's help for background information but you really need to use your own information when you are using it in academic research purpose to give it your own voice next slide yeah. please and Jayadi, I was just going to point out there was a, a chat um, just now um, exactly to that point about um, would we recommend chat GPT for finding, finding citations and relevant sources. So I think the slide that you just showed um, is an excellent example of that, of how chat GPT can kind of really just make up and sound very confident in giving its answer to you. Um, but the citation may, might be totally made up or false. And so, especially if you're doing academic work, um, there was also another note about graduate level work in the chat. If you're doing that sort of work, you really want to make sure that you're diligent about fact checking your citations. If ChatGPT is giving you a citation, you can simply copy that citation, drop it into Google Scholar or drop it into OneSearch and verify if in fact that study was ever conducted and published in a peer review journal. Exactly. So I'm gonna get to our next question, um, Jayadi, um, whenever you're yes. ready. So now that we talked about how Cal State LA faculty are talking about uh, using uh, use of chat GPT in the, uh, including that into the academic dishonesty policy. I want to hear from you all. Do any of your courses have a policy on the use of chat GPT? And, and, and are you aware of it? We're one of the reasons why we're curious about this question is um, because the tech, this sort of technology, generative um, text AI in particular, is very new still, and it's uh, changing a lot of the ways um, that we're responding to plagiarism in higher education. So um, faculty um, are writing uh, policy um, to kind of use in their own classes, and oftentimes they'll put that in a syllabus. Um, and again, like Jayadi was mentioning, uh, we're having conversations, the faculty at Cal State LA is having conversations, kind of like on a sort of larger level about um, the use of AI um, in academia. Um, keep in mind too that other, other people too, like um, states and nation states are also coming up with different policies on chat GPT. I, I think the EU is probably at the forefront right now of developing kind of like a um, AI bill of rights. Um, and I think the United States is also kind of working on some language towards that. But again, a lot of the landscape right now, as far as how um, uh, the correct ways of using uh, generative AI and AI technologies is still unfolding. And so um, based on the answers here, we see that, yeah, um, we uh, are having some classes, right? We have some classes at Cal State LA where um, this, the, our, our faculty are providing um, sort of a, a guidelines for the use of chat GPT. We'll keep this on. Feel free to keep adding to it. And we're going to get to the concluding part of our presentation with thinking about um, some ethical questions. So one of the things I want to really emphasize to you is that the way that these large language models work is from content that human beings, people like me and you and other people too, like authors, musicians, other creatives, um, all the sort of information and content that we've generated and have 
put on platforms um, on the internet. So the way that OpenAI ChatGPT, for instance, has trained um, its, its model, ChatGPT, is by really extracting and pulling large sets of language data from things like Wikipedia, Reddit, um, other chat forums, blogs, even um, uh, sites like the New York Times, for instance, right now, there's a lawsuit undergoing um, involving the New York Times is suing, I believe, Microsoft for using its content without authorization um, or without consent. So all of that um, brings up all kinds of different ethical questions. And I want to encourage you to think about it in terms of this concept called surveillance capitalism. So this image here um, is kind of like a, a good visual example of what is surveillance capitalism, which was first coined by Shoshana Zuboff. Shoshana Zuboff is a scholar um, and uh, a professor at Harvard, I believe. And she's written several books about um, this phenomenon that we are all living within this, this sort of world of surveillance capitalism, where different um, applications that we uh, engage with, Instagram, Reddit, you know, all this sort of um, technology and apps that we that we um, consume and use. Um, it's kind of watching us. It's well, maybe it's not kind of watching us, it really is watching us. And it's listening to us. And it's actually kind of recording and taking account of our behaviors um, and our uses usages of, of things online. And then it's sort of flipping it around. And it's repackaging things to sell to us. So that Spotify playlist that's curated just for you, or that reading list from Amazon that's sent over to you, um, or you know how your um, your iWatch knows what time you know you're exercising or going to bed. All this stuff is kind of generated to then resell you something. So generative AI. Um, and the other software that we talked about today, this is also part of this kind of umbrella of surveillance capitalism. So for instance, the questions that we're typing into gen to ChatGPT at this moment, ChatGPT OpenAI, the company, which is a for-profit company, is using those questions to then repackage and resell and make more sophisticated the paid version of ChatGPT. So we want you to be aware of that because um, it's important to know your, your role um, in the use of it. And the really important thing we want to have you take away from today's workshop is that the, the, the emphasis of developing your own voice, this is really one of the main things that you will do at Cal State LA. One of the main purposes of you training in your respective majors and areas is to have a critique, to be able to voice your opinion, your arguments based on accurate data to then, you know, give your position and participate in the scholarly conversation, as they say. So with that um, emphasis on developing your own voice, we'll take a few questions. We are really at time, but we're happy to stay on. Um, if anyone has any questions, and that concludes our presentation for today.